first of all want to compliment the men who are here because men think they shouldn't be doing anything to do with theater, so good for you all. Um, good morning. Good morning. Uh, I'm, as I said, Rosalind Benson. Um, I'm the assistant dean for the School of Creative Arts. And um, I, as I said, I don't lecture very much. I discuss, so I hope you'll discuss with me a little bit. I'd kind of like to know, before we really get into this a little bit, who you are, just very quickly who you are and where you're from. That's always part of what I do because I think then I can try and remember your name. So you are? Mary, I'm from Virginia Beach. Mary, okay, Virginia. Al and Claire from Naples. So you're close. Well, I'm close enough to remember. Oh, okay. <laughs> okay. Pat Austin, McLean, Virginia. Diane from South Carolina, but I live in New York for 20 years. Oh, that's why you asked me about New York, okay. And your name is I am, okay. <laughs> All right. I can very easily. Oh, great. Are you the John that they told me would surely be in my improvisation class? They've given me some warnings about John, someone John, that he's full of energy. Is that you? No. Oh, okay. <laughs> okay. Okay. Diane from uh, from Florida and Cleveland. Cleveland. Okay. So what we're going to talk about today is um, why is theater an agent for social change, or should it be? And and I'd like to do it through discussion, but what I want, what I'm planning to do is give you some specific examples of how it has been some questions that people have asked as, as to whether it should be, and then to show you a couple of very short uh, clips from a group of people that performed in a play 20 years ago when it really was life-changing, and they're reflecting on it because they're doing a 20th anniversary production, and then a very, very short clip of a cast that I worked with doing the same play this fall. So it'll, they'll be very short and not loud. So first of all, I want to know, do you all go to the theater? Yes. Oh, yes. So why do you go to the theater? What's your reason? To be entertained. To be entertained. Okay, that's the primary. Something new. What else? To laugh. To laugh, okay. <laughs> social change, social change, social change. Yeah. Okay, to laugh, what other reasons would you go to the theater? Do you? Okay, so, for, so primarily... We go to the theater so that we can be entertained, which is kind of interesting. We go to escape our real life because goodness knows that's not interesting. <laughs> and yet I bet you all have very, very interesting lives. <laughs> okay. Um, very, very famous um, playwright David Mamet says, uh, drama, meaning why you go to the theater, is a mystery. So you go because it's a mystery. And it's an exploration undertaken by actors and audience at the same time to explore the unconscious mind. Now when I read that, I felt a little overwhelmed. Because first of all, then it's like theater is a th psychological explanation. So I started thinking about theater as an agent of social change, and I started thinking about my own life and um, why I think theater is important. And I'm going to sit, if that's okay with you. Um, when I was younger and I had a four-year-old child, he, um, I just was convinced that he had no sympathy to the rest of the world. 
It was all about him, which now in my later life, I realize that's what a four-year-old child is supposed to be thinking about, <laughs> all about him. And I got a little bit panicky about it because I thought he's not, he's not paying attention to the feelings of all the other people. So we sat on the sofa and read, not at one sitting, but pretty close to, The Velveteen Rabbit. Do you all know the story of The Velveteen Rabbit? And I was convinced that that would teach him empathy. The Velveteen Rabbit is about this rabbit that this boy loves and loves and loves, and um, gets, he gets very sick with a fever of some kind, and they have to throw all his toys away. Um, but the Velveteen Rabbit sort of gets discarded. And as he's discarded, he becomes real. And so this idea that something is real is so important in that you don't even know what your stuffed animals are like. So I started thinking, is that why I went into theater? He did become an empathetic child, <laughs> eventually. Um, but then I read this in the paper the other day, and I think it's worth reading. Um, this is a, a theater blog, and it's by a man named Everett Robert, and he wrote on January 25th, 2013, this is an issue I've been struggling with since Sandy Hook, Newtown, Connecticut school shooting. How should we as artists, playwrights, directors, and actors respond to such a tragedy? How do we share our voice and our beliefs? Should we even say a thing? Do we have a responsibility beyond just entertaining? And then he wrote a little bit about a play that he was submitting about this. And then he says, obviously, I think it can, or I wouldn't have spent two days writing and polishing and editing a 10-minute play for that purpose, focusing my attention on something else. I'm reminded of a quote John Cheever said, art is the triumph over chaos. Theater is an art. And without it, in any form, we are allowing chaos to triumph. So we, as artists, have a responsibility to be an agent of change in our society. Every great story has a character going through an emotional or physical change from who they are to who they should be. This, in turn, should challenge the audience to examine their own life and change. I also think we're a visual society, that you can express in characters what is often not heard in debate. You can debate about AIDS or homosexuality if you don't know such people, but when you watch a piece such as Angels in America or Rent, you come face to face with people who are suffering from AIDS or are real people who happen to be gay or suffer a hate crime. So yes, I do think that theater should be an agent of social change. Makes a pretty strong argument, doesn't he? So then I started going back and thinking, this is not such a brand new idea. It really isn't. This has been going on for years and years and years. I mean, you could go back to when the Greeks were writing about war or making sure that men had feelings by um, talking about withholding sex from all the men in order to get them to stop going to war. A little bit extreme. Yes, yeah, right. Um, so I started thinking again about other kinds of more contemporary ways. And so I'm going to go back through a couple of decades. Um, and this is probably the first person that we know today who was interested in theater as social change. And he had a different way of doing it. So most of you know of Bertolt Brecht, right? So he wrote a play in 1939. And it's really interesting because these all go by decades and I was so surprised by my choices, like fates were with me. Um, so Bertolt Brecht wrote Mother Courage. Do you know the play Mother Courage? No. You are just like my students who say, why do you make us read this play? <laughs> and um, it's fairly interminable. It's very long. And it's, it is about a woman and her children, her three children, and she pulls a cart through the country. It starts in 1500 and it ends up in much, probably 
almost the end of that century and goes from war to war to war and she survives. She survives by selling things to soldiers and to people. But as soon as there's a peace coming, she doesn't survive anymore. She can't keep going because no one's going to buy her things. And in fact, she sacrifices her children. She, she lets one child be killed. She lets another child go off to war where she knows he'll be killed. And her third daughter, who is mute, she lets go to the top of a roof to bang on the roof to warn the villagers that people are coming to destroy them. And in consequence, she dies. So I asked my students, why is the play called Mother Courage? And that's what some of them say. She had the courage to do those things. And then, then you, and this is what Brecht wanted us to think about. So was it okay then? Do the ends justify the means? So what he did when he did this play is, she's not, these people do not do it realistically. Everything happens on stage in bright white light. People bring up um, signs telling you the name of the scene. There are 20 some scenes. And they hold up the sign and say, this is what's gonna happen now. This is what's gonna happen now. You don't connect with any of the characters. He did this with a, about, he called it theater of alienation. You separated the audience from feeling about the people. You just watched them and you watched their ideas. You didn't want to take action, but you were in here, in your head. Well, that's pretty different from The Velveteen Rabbit, isn't it? But because he wrote it in 1939, what was going to happen in 1939? Right. He got expelled from his country, sent abroad to work. He was very, it was very powerful because people saw this and they didn't know. That, I mean. Everyone thinks war is bad, but what happens during a war? People get killed, but companies profit. Oh, so now how do you, I mean, we don't want people to, we don't want people to starve. And we don't want people to die. We want people to be successful in business. So what Brecht was doing was, it was a beginning of I mean, this is not the beginning of theater for social change, but it was the beginning of saying, let's think about this. Let's think about how theater works, how we put these things together. Do our actions have consequences? So now we're gonna jump a little ways further. We're gonna jump to um, 1949. And many of you probably know this play. Right? Do you know Arthur Miller? Okay. Arthur Miller was a big advocate of social change, but his belief was that it all had to be in the story and you had to care about the people. So the first play that he wrote, Death of a Salesman, now, now this might be the play we know, right? Yeah. None of us knew Mother Courage, but we might know Death of a Salesman. So is there anyone that doesn't know Death of a Salesman so sure I could tell the story a little bit? Because you can tell I like that, right? <laughs> um, is there anyone that doesn't? Okay, perfect. So Death of a Salesman is about this man who is at the end of his life. He's done everything right. He's done what people wanted him to do. He was liked. But he wasn't well liked. Only a, only a small number of people paid attention to him. And his American dream died when he killed himself. What happened when they did that play first? This is a story that my theater teacher told me and I'll never forget it. They did that play on Broadway and for 45 minutes, the audience just sat there. They didn't applaud, they didn't do anything, they just sat. 
different kind of social change, right? It, what, what do you think they were thinking about? Yes. So then it suddenly became them moving from that what they saw on stage to what am I doing with my life? Is it the same? Am I striving to be liked? He wrote another play. God, oh, then, then he was hot, you know. He was, okay, I, I know how to do this thing. So what did he write next? He wrote The Crucible, which is a play that's done over and over and over in high schools, which is pretty interesting. And The Crucible is about the Salem witch trials, but it's not about that at all. The Crucible is about Joe McCarthy and people being called out for being communists. Not the same response. It did not get a very good response, actually. First of all, it's got way too many words. I don't know. Have you read The Crucible? Any of you read The Crucible? Did you have to read it in high school? I did it with my own when I was doing it. All right. <laughs> <laughs> actually, The Crucible is the first play I was ever in in high school. Our, in my high school, I grew up in Detroit. There was only one, we did one play a year. And I had no interest in theater, but I thought, why not audition? And I uh, got cast in The Crucible, which was pretty interesting because I was a big political, I would have studied political science. That would have been my choice. Um, but I got caught up in this theater thing. And I liked the political aspect of theater. So The Crucible was not, did not work as well. Why do we think it didn't work as well? Probably because you couldn't relate to the characters. They were too far away from us. So we've got 1939, he wrote Death of a Salesman in 1949. Now we're gonna jump, I'm gonna make sure I'm staying on time here. Okay, we're gonna jump a little bit further to 1959. Do you know Lorraine Hansberry? Wrote A Raisin in the Sun. And she wrote that play in response to well, actually, as a part of the civil rights movement. Raisin in the Sun is about an African-American family who lives in Chicago, and they suddenly inherit $10,000. Now, remember, it's 1959, so $10,000 was a lot of money then. <laughs> and they were trying to think of what should they do with that $10,000. And the mother of the household wanted to buy a house where they could all live together in safety. The son wanted to invest it in a liquor store so that he could make money and they would live happily ever after, which is kind of the American dream. The son's daughter wanted to use the money to pay for medical school so that she could go on and live a different life. What happens in the play, through a series of complicated plot events, they lose 6,000 of the dollars because one of, one of the characters does invest it in a liquor store and it's a scam and the money's gone. The daughter breaks up with her boyfriend who is very traditional and um, does not believe in what she believes in, which is the beginning of the civil rights movement that blacks should not live oppressed and should be able to go out and do what everybody else does. And the mother says, I'm taking the money and I'm buying a house. So they buy a house in Clybourne Park, which is a predominantly white neighborhood and of course suffer, for want of a better word, the slings and arrows of what it's like to be a family of one race moving into a family of another race. Now, if you get a chance, I'm gonna recommend that you go and see a brand new play called Clybourne Park. Clybourne Park. A man, and I can't remember his first name, his last name is Norris, has written this play about what happens to the house afterward when a yuppie white family wants to buy it in, and gentrify the neighborhood. So look at the impact of Lorraine Hansberry's play. 
which is amazing. Now, my good friend, Dr. Paul Jackson, who teaches in the theater department, will, and who is an African-American man, will not look at Clybourne Park. He said, I am not going to take some white person's view on what happened, which is really interesting to me because I read like Rain Hansberry's play. So Paul and I sort of argue this out, you know, like what should we do? Come on, why are you thinking that way? But that play, first of all, I said, talked about Bertolt Brecht, Arthur Miller. Lorraine Hansberry's the first woman who's writing for social change, which I think is pretty interesting. Did it have a big impact on the theater? It did. Why do you think it did? Yeah, our views are very different. My, my mother tells me that it's very easy for me to be a liberal academic. My mother lived in Detroit. Well, I grew up in Detroit, in the city, and then lived in Ann Arbor, and then moved to Oxford. My parents left Detroit in 1985. They sold their house for $14,000, was what, what they had paid for it in 1940, because their entire neighborhood had changed. They had a crack dealer living next door. They had, I mean, nothing I had experienced. And she kept saying to me, you don't understand. My, now, my mom is still very liberal, but my father, on the day he died, was, I will never forgive, not the people who moved into the neighborhood, but the real estate agents who scared everybody else into selling. You better sell, you better sell, your neighborhood's changing, quick, go, go, go. So it's exactly what happened to Lorraine Hansberry, and what she's talking about. Now, that's my father's view. That is not necessarily what happened. And I think it's really important that I say that so I don't alienate anyone who's a real estate agent in here. But not only for that, because you only see things through your own eyes. You only see things the way it affects you, which is the connection to theater, because theater helps us look through other people's eyes which I think is really good. Doesn't mean you have to agree, but you have to at least look. Whoops, I'm losing my, the camera. That's not good, okay, there we go. Um, so now I wanna move from there to kind of a negative use of theater as social change. I wanna make sure I'm saying all the things that I wanna say. Um, well, actually, we won't do the negative. We'll do the positive first, and then we'll do negative, and then we'll do Miami. Yes, okay. Um, this is a positive woman, and you may have heard of her. This is in 1996, Eve Ensler. Do any of you know Eve Ensler? She wrote The Vagina Monologues. And um, that was a result of several things. So I'm going to go backwards and forwards for a minute. Eve Ensler talks about herself as a very privileged white woman growing up in middle-class America who looked on the surface as if everything, what she had the most wonderful life in the world. She didn't. She was raised by an alcoholic father who abused and molested her, by a mother who wouldn't stand up to him, and she lived in terror most of the time. In fact, I want to read, if you don't mind, just a minute, because she has this really wonderful description of her life um, in a TED Talk. So if you ever want to see a TED Talk, um, she says, when I was a little girl and I grew up in a wealthy community, it was an upper middle class white community and it had all the trappings and looks of a perfectly nice, wonderful, great life. And everyone was supposed to be happy in that community. And in fact, my life was hell. I lived with an alcoholic father who beat me and molested me. And it was inside me. And always a as a child, I had this fantasy that somebody would come and rescue me. And I actually made up a little character whose name was Mr. Alligator. 
And I'd call him up when things got really bad, and I would say, it's time to come and pick me up. And I'd go back and pack a little bag, and I would wait for Mr. Alligator to come. Now, Mr. Alligator never did come. But the idea of Mr. Alligator coming actually saved my sanity and made it okay for me to keep going because I believed in the distance there would be someone coming to save me. What she discovered later on as she grew up, that she had to save herself. Now that fantasy was a good thing. She began writing and what she chose to write about was she started interviewing women. She interviewed women over and over again about how they felt about their bodies. And it was very difficult for her at first. Um, and she talks about this in this TED Talk. I don't, do you know TED Talks where you can just click on them and, oh, go, just Google TED Talks. They're wonderful. They're all, any, you know, there's billions and billions of them. Well, that's an exaggeration. There are probably hundreds of them. And some are pretty good and some are, yeah. Um, but she, she does this TED Talk where she says, I interviewed all these women thinking I was going to hear wonderful stories of their sexual life that were going to be good. And I realized that all they wanted to talk about is that they were beaten and battered and how many people raped them and how awful it was. And as she worked through this, she put down some of the stories in the vagina monologues not about the beating necessarily or the rapes, but about how women feel about their bodies because that was interesting to her. And then she kept on doing this and she got active in the United Nations and she found out statistically that one in three women in the world have been beaten or sexually molested. That's amazing, unbelievable. And sometimes we don't even hear it. We don't even think about it. So what did she do? She said, how can I stop this? So she, had, she did the vagina monologues in New York with famous actors with Glenn Close, with Whoopi Goldberg. It's a series of monologues and they read them and it was explosive. Then someone picked up the idea and said, we're gonna do this on college campuses all across the country and the profits that we make from this will go straight to helping battered women. Theater for social change. Now, I don't know if any of you have seen the vagina monologues. They do it at Miami. Now you've seen it. Was it entertaining and in a weird way? You laugh and you cry. So it is entertainment, which we said is one of the reasons we go to theater, but it's not song and dance. It's not, pardon me? It's not escape, right. It's very in your face. So I think that's, that's a different way of using theater for social change, which is really positive. And then I, I want to continue on one thing she read. Um, I mean, she wrote about Mr. Alligator. She said, um, so we're going to cut to 40 years later, and she goes to Kenya. And we're walking, and we arrive at the opening of this house that this woman that she's rescued and actually helped this woman because the tradition in the Maasai, Maasai tribes was that you are just the way a uh, young man is circumcised, that a woman is circumcised, and it's awful. And so this woman, Agnes, has gone around the country in um, Africa working to try to stop this practice. And she said, so cut to 40 years later, we go to Kenya and we're walking, we arrive at the opening of the house, and Agnes hasn't let me come in for days, Agnes is the woman, because they were preparing for this ritual. I want to tell you a story. When Agnes first started, fighting to stop female genit genital ew, mutilation in her community, she'd become an outcast and she was exiled. In the meantime, she was transformed. So then she, Eve Ensler said, we arrived at the house and when we arrived, there were hundreds of girls dressed in red, 
homemade dresses, which is the color of the Maasai and the color of the day, which is when they do the vagina monologues. And they greeted us and they'd made up these songs that they were singing about the end of suffering and the end of mutilation. And they walked us down the path and it was a gorgeous day in the African sun and the dust was flying and the girls were dancing and there was this house and it said, Vide, safe house for girls. And it hit me in that moment that it had taken 47 years, but that Mr. Alligator had finally shown up. And he'd shown up obviously in a form that it took me a long time to understand. Now, I find that to be absolutely powerful. I, I mean, she's written another, she's written several plays, but she's written another one that I would urge you to read called Necessary Targets. Do you want to write that down? And it is about um, her, I'll read you the blurb in the back. Two American women, a Park Avenue psychiatrist and an ambitious young writer traveled to Bosnia to help women refugees confront their memories of war. And it deals with the women and their memories of war, but also when we think we can go into a country and be the savior. And that's not necessarily what we do. And she had to learn from that. So now I'm going to go to a whole other thing that is ended up positively but starts negatively. I don't know if any, do any of you National Public Radio listeners? Some, yeah. Well, see, I tend to listen constantly. I'm very upset my hotel room doesn't get the radio, and I kept trying to plug, push it, and it wasn't working. Okay. <laughs> well, it, it's, my radio doesn't work in my room, so there we go. My alarm worked, though. Um, so there's a program on National Public Radio called This American Life. Ira Glass narrates it. And Ira Glass is a very good storyteller, very, very powerful man. And he had a powerful man in his world which National Public Radio, well, I might love it, is a fairly small world, <laughs> okay? Um, so he had heard a man do a one-man theater performance in New York um, at the Roundabout, actually. And his name is Mike Daisy. Have you heard this at all? Have you, any of you heard about this man? Okay, Mike Daisy is a very compelling storyteller very, very dramatic and very um, in your face kind of talks about his own life and he's very good, very good. Mike Daisy? Yes. Oh, you might not want to know about him after I get done. <laughs> no, that's not fair. <laughs> um, so what Mike Daisy did is he developed this theater piece, oh, and I've got to get it right. It's the agony and the ecstasy of Steve Jobs. And he, uh, his piece was a one hour, one and a half hour, depending on, expose of when he went to China and saw all of these underaged workers being worked many, many hours. And some of them being mutilated and maimed because there were no safety procedures in the shops and they were all making iPads and iPhones. And this was awful. And this monologue that he did was very, very powerful. Now, did you ever hear, did you ever hear him? No, but I know what happened. Okay, you know, okay. <laughs> okay. Um, and so this was so powerful, this piece was so powerful, people would sit and listen to him and just be so angry with Steve Jobs and Apple and how could they do this in this American company taking advantage of these people and I mean it really was horrible. So Ira Glass invited him to this American life to do, to do the story on the radio and he did. It was the most popular episode of this American life there ever was. And then Ira Glass found out it was all a lie. It, he had made it up. He did go to China. He did travel around. He never saw any or spoke to any underage workers. 
He never saw anybody maimed or killed. Because they wouldn't let the doctor see it? He didn't see it. It didn't ha the, what The information he got were all from the Apple reports of injuries that had happened in their factories. No, that Steve Jobs created. The Apple company itself reported on what was happening. Now, the interesting thing is, there are not, they're not terrific conditions there. Some of them are really awful. But the New York Times took up Mike Daisy's story and wrote an expose, and people started reacting. I mean, I can remember one of my dear professors said, don't buy an iPhone. You know, stop that. The power of theater as an agent for social change, and yet, it was a lie. Now, the interesting thing is, Ira Glass then puts Mike Daisy back on the radio and said, I want you to tell me what happened. And he, he blamed, Ira Glass blamed himself and his radio crew. He said, we did not fact check enough. The biggest thing that they didn't do was they didn't seek out his translator, which was interesting. And when they finally found his translator, he, actually it wasn't Ira Glass, it was someone else, another reporter who did that. And they said, she said we went to, we did go to China, we did talk to people, but none of the things, he didn't see any of those things. So now we've got this conflict. Did it really, I mean, did those things happen? I don't know. But Mike Daisy used theater as a tool for social change that was not fair. And so then that made, and I heard him on the radio saying, but we have to lie sometimes to get to the truth. I was driving. <laughs> I was so angry. I didn't, I was like <laughs> Because what happens then to theater after that? People don't always believe. Yeah, they don't believe, I mean, you don't always believe it anyway, right. because it is make-believe. Right. But he was telling it as if he were there. If he could say this was an imag, this is what I imagined happened, or if he had created a story about someone, we could accept that. So it, it speaks larger to the responsibility of theater as when this man from the very beginning that I to told you about wrote about Sandy Hook, what should, what's our responsibility as an artist? I think our main responsibility as artists are to tell the truth. Not the truth as we see it, but the truth, or to say this is a work of fiction. So, which gets me to my last one, which is my favorite. Oh no, I've got one more, because this is real. I just read this. I saw it, and then I read it. This is um, a play that I saw at uh, either Steppenwolf or the Goodman. I should know that, shouldn't I? called Good Boys and True. Have you, any of you heard of that? Well, it's a lovely little play about um, a Jesuit high school in New England. It's written by a man, the author is Roberto Aguirre Sarcasa. Would you like me to spell the last part? <laughs> okay, it's A-G-U-I-R-R-E hyphen S-A-C-S-A, S-A-C-A-S-A. -A -A. Good Boys and True is uh, about this young man who is everything we would want our sons to be. He's a star athlete, he's very bright, he's going to Princeton, he's everything is perfect. And um, he goes to this wonderful school, his dad's on the board of the school, his dad went to this school, this Jesuit high school, he's popular, and the play starts out with the coach of the team he's on telling his mother that they have found boys in the locker room watching a film of a young man having sex with a young girl in all of its variations. The team was watching it and he's pretty convinced, the coach is pretty convinced that it's her son. But he's willing to cover it all up. 
and just keep it quiet if she can find out that it wasn't him. So she goes to her son and asks him, and of course he says, oh, no, of course it wasn't me. And um, she thinks they can deal with it, but she's scared because she doesn't exactly know what's, what that means. And um, they talk about the good old boy system in this boarding school. And one of the teachers tells her about her husband, not in the same kind of incident, but where things were covered up. She asks her son again, is it true? And he said, of course it's not true. Flashback to the young man with the man he really does love, another student. And he felt pressured to do this so no one would think he was gay. Moves forward, the son confesses to the mother, but doesn't see anything wrong with what he did. Doesn't see anything wrong with the girl that he, he didn't take his girlfriend. This was a girl he met in a mall. And the mother is so angry, but the angriest person is his gay partner who says, you lied to me, you said it wasn't you. How could you do that? When we saw this play, we saw one of the earlier productions and there was a talk back afterwards where you could talk to the playwright. The play hasn't gone anywhere. Did it in New York, not successful. Why do you think? Go ahead, there's no right answer here. What do you think? I, I've met the people in New York, and I do go to theater in New York, which I never, I, I go with friends. Some of them only want to see the light musical part of the book. So there are too many people that will not go to see serious drama. Okay, so that might be why it wouldn't work in New York. I think you're absolutely right. Absolutely. Also, don't we all fear that that's happening? Yeah. I mean, right now, you know, that might be happening in the schools that we know. Boy, it hit home to me. My son went to a Jesuit school, and I know the good old boy system is in play there. Um, I don't, th I, you know, I tr it was also the best education he could have possibly gotten, and I know that. But I think, did that stuff go on? Yeah, yeah, I mean, that's a young, young 17, I don't want to know that their life is like that. I want them to have lived the way I did in high school. We went and I did, I auditioned for the Crucible, you know? It was just so simple. So that's, that, and I think the person that wrote that play wrote it to do a social change. I think he wanted to expose that, but we're not yet ready for it. Which gets to the very last play. I wanted to talk about it in this play. I directed this fall, and I feel so lucky. I've been wanting to do this play forever and ever and ever. And some of you may know it. This is my script, which I love. <laughs> which is Angels in America by Tony Kushner. The reason, one of the reasons why Angels in America was so successful was because of when it was done. It was done 20 years ago, 1992. And at that time, do any of you, do some of you I know know this play, but do most of you know this play? Should I do a little? Yeah, this is a harder one to synopsis for me, actually, because it's 26 scenes, and it, uh, Tony Kushner just wrote the screenplay for Lincoln, which is pretty cool. Um, and the play won a Pulitzer Prize, which is interesting. Death of a Salesman won a Pulitzer Prize. Raisin in the Sun won a Pulitzer Prize. Um, so I think that's important, <laughs> but um, and Pulitzer Prize means that it had an effect, which I think is the big thing for it. Um, Angels in America is uh, essentially about two couples, two gay men who are a couple, and a, a man and a woman who are a couple, young man and a woman, the Mormon couple. The two gay men one of them discovers that he has AIDS. And in 1980, the play takes place in 1985, even though it was written in 1992. When you discovered you had AIDS in 1985, that was a death sentence. 
because there wasn't anything they could do about it. And nobody acknowledged it. And when you went into a hospital, people, nurses didn't treat you. No one would touch you. The Mormon couple, very strong religious people, the, the man is an attorney and he works for Roy Cohn, who is a real character from the McCarthy trials. And Roy Cohn was um, an attorney who prosecuted anyone who was communist. He, he prosecuted Julius and Ethel Rosenberg and made sure that Ethel Rosenberg was put to death. What's very interesting is in 1992, when Kushner wrote this play, er, there were a number of people that thought Ethel and Julius really were not spies. And their sons went on to try to defend them. And just in the last two or three years have we found out that they really were spies. But Roy Cohn was not a nice person. He was actually an evil man. So this one attorney is working for him. The Mormon guy is working for Roy Cohn. Roy Cohn is a notorious homosexual who is in the closet. Never revealed it. And he's diagnosed. Now, the play takes a lot of liberties, and it says it's a work of fiction. It is not true, it, but he's a real character in the play. The Mormon man is gay, but he's fighting it and fighting it and fighting it because his religion will not allow him to do so. And he does have a very strong religious belief. His wife has decided that her way of coping with the fact that she doesn't realize her husband loves her, doesn't love her, is to take pills. She's a Valium addict. Okay, so we got that going on over there. Over here, we've got this couple that the guy is diagnosed with AIDS, and his partner, who he's been with for four years, realizes he can't stay through the sickness of it. And he leaves him. And of course, who does he connect with? No. The Mormon guy. <laughs> so the first part of the play deals with their relationships, but it also deals with the young man who has been diagnosed with AIDS. And he is almost, he's dying and he's visited by supernatural creatures. He's visited by angel, an angel who tells him that he's going to be a prophet and change the world. And, and it, because it's the millennium approaches, it was 1999 was going to come, you know, still 10 years down the road, and he does not want to be a prophet. So this play was written at a time Kushner wrote to say we should be a community, that that was important for us to be a community and care for each other. But also, let's say the word AIDS at that time no one in the government would acknowledge that AIDS was happening. 20,000 people in the United States died from AIDS, and nobody even mentioned the word or would do anything about it. And so that was part of the reason that Kushner wrote the play. So if, if I can, oh, this is going to be a challenge. I get so nervous <laughs> because I talk. I don't do technology, but I think I can handle this. Let's see. That pretty soon the light will go on. Okay, thank you. All right, good. Oh. So what I want to do is show you a couple of clips from this 20th anniversary celebration of it. They did it in um, Los Angeles. And the people who were in the original production talking about what the play meant then and how people reacted to it. So let's see. Um, okay. We'll get this big. What it meant to be gay in America changed forever. In the early and mid-90s, the play had an agitprop component apart from everything else that was going on. I mean, there are a million things going on. But one powerful piece of it was this kind of almost Clifford Odette play. Yes, that's what I, that's what is that's what we need to hear finally. That is the truth as we see it, and as it has not been said before. And yes, 
years later, you know, I, I've met so many people who would say to me, that play changed my life. You don't understand what happened. I brought my parents. I came out. It changed how I thought about theater. It changed me as a writer. It changed me all this. And I wanted just to be able to hear myself again. But when a play hits the moment of its time, it actually strikes the nerve that the nerve strikes. You can feel that play contributing to changing the temperature, changing the entire play and the country as a whole. There were these, these moments of, of such raw intensity. There was this sense of um, that we'd been through this extraordinary um, event together, and it was really moving. That was part of the joy of performing it, I think, that at the end of it, we were all applauding each other. It was just kind of, my God, we've made it through this journey together. I'm very curious to see what it's going to be like now. Well, the idea is that as new story, the emotion of new story, that, uh, that will that synchronicity of history and time and time together as a whole become a different kind of reality? I don't know. May I teach one American Coming Home? Those kids bonded to play it because of Red Smith. They were entertainers. They weren't able to take stairs. They sat on the airports. They couldn't take up. Oh, coming Home was still speaks to young people and is immediately attached to them as their story tells. I think our town or any great classic play, when you re-encounter it in your life at different points in your life, it has different meaning. Um, and that's the, that's, the, that's the great thing about it. So because we're getting close to the end, I thought I would shift to, instead of, I've got clips from other actors talking about this play, but to when we did it at Miami. Because when we did it at Miami, it was tw 21 years later, and the students were so excited, because I teach this play, and, but I only teach first year students, some theater majors, some not but they were excited about doing this play. The young man that was in the video last night that was, you know, that you could see the rehearsal, that's the rehearsal of Angels. They were, we, we made this pact from the beginning that we were going to care for each other because it was very important to us. And so what they got from the play as an agent of social change was a little bit different. So it's a little bit self-promoting uh, of me and I'm not, I don't, that's not what I want to do, but I want you to listen to the student voices in here. So we'll do this one. And this was actually made by a grad student um, as a trailer to, to uh, advertise Angels. I guess I have to press the button, don't I? So this is, if you remember, Gates of Beglin. We were all pretty tired <laughs> at this point. I mean, the show that I'm directing oh. is Angels in America, Part One, Millennium Approaches by Tony Kushner. I wanted to have students here do it, and I just think it's, um, it encompasses so many, so many aspects of theater. It's comic, it's dramatic, it's theatricality, and it deals with real world issues that even though they took a trip of 20 years ago, I think are still very, very important. Here's the one I want you to hear and the next young student. Take care of somebody. 
hard to define as a genre because there are a lot of parts that are just hilarious and there are a lot of parts that just make you cry and there is so much spectacle to the show in the show it's just amazing um, what we were able to do was to really bring that out of the script not the path that they thought they were going to have. Um, when Pryor's diagnosed with AIDS, it's a death sentence. In 1985, it was a death sentence. So that's why you can do things. Well, just like you don't say homosexual when it's a drug use. Well, for my drug artist and gay youth in America to help um, gain an understanding of that, because people still have, get AIDS today, and it's not really something Oh, I wish I could have gotten to, there's, there's more, but I know where time is done. Um, but there's a young woman at the very end who says, what this play tells us, the stage manager, if you don't love each other, things don't turn out so well. We have to love each other. That's what we have to do. So I think it's a pretty powerful agent of social change, right? Thank you for going through this journey with me. <laughs> and uh, if you want any more of the play stuff, I can give you things. Thank you again.